So welcome everybody. I think we've got a few more people coming in and <clears throat> more joining as we go along. Bear with us. And we will be punctual. Stefano, nice to see you here, Stefano. Yeah. Lovely. So I'm going to kick off. Is everybody ready? Yep. Yes. Thumbs up. Excellent. Why don't we see our audience? Davina, could, sh should we show our participants at the moment? Let's just see a collective. So we can all see each other as we all join. So I'm going to start off with a short introduction as to who we are at Fashion Revolution. And then we're going to hand over the um, call, conference call to Ali Gromali and Apurva Qatari, our guest speaker for today. Um, Essentially, for those that might not know Fashion Revolution, we are a global movement, a not-for-profit not organization, founded by two incredible women, Carrie Summers and Ursula de Castro, um, in response to the tragic Rana Plaza disaster. Um, a collective came together and um, started a movement in a bid to create a fairer, safer, and more transparent fashion industry. Uh, where people from all over the world, um, we are part, some of us are part of the fashion industry, some of us are not, some fashion lovers, um, some that make clothes. Uh, we really are from a broad spectrum um, and various walks of life. Um, our vision is essentially that we want a global fashion industry that conserves and restores the environmental, the environment and values um, people as opposed to just growth and profit. Um, recently, as you all know, there's been um, a massive shift happening in the uh, fashion industry and particularly with some of the sustainable fashion um, industry insiders that we've been speaking to. And we wanted to start generating dialogues to see how COVID-19 has impacted people um, across the board. And so we do want to hear from you all. Um, if you've got some compelling stories, insights, or on the ground, you want to share information with us, do reach out to Fashion Revolution India. Um, we're here to listen. Uh, we are a collective. Um, we want you to be part of the dialogues too. We don't have all the answers, but we are um, gathering insight, information and research and really trying to um, direct people into avenues of, of, of positive action. Um, so without much uh, more to say. I'm going to pass this over to um, Alia Gromali, who's a prolific writer, producer, and she's um, the head of strategy at Fashion Revolution India. Um, she's curated the shift together with um, my teammates in India, uh, Rini Bankwell, who heads our regional um, area of Delhi and North, um, Shruti Singh, who works on our policy arm, and uh, we've also got Davina from Fairtrade India here, a very important pillar to our organization. Um, and so today, Urva and Alia will be diving deep into discussions about um, shifting goalposts and how um, how essentially a Burva, who is the founder of No Nasties and Once Upon a Doug, how he has um, embraced change and um, has been paving the way forward for their organisation. So over to you, Alia, for what is the new normal for India's homegrown fashion? Thank you, Suki. Thank you so much. Um, so I just want to uh, start off by saying that um, Many years ago, when I was uh, curious about, you know, sustainable fashion and ethical fashion, um, I was sent by a friend of mine, uh, Monica Dogra, from the band Shire and Funk. Uh, Monica was like, hey, you know, we are getting organic cotton t-shirts made as our band merchandise. And I, my ears poked up. I was like, what do you mean? We're getting, what, 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 what? And so then I sort of started asking questions and, you know, figuring out who's doing this. I think this was like five, seven years ago. And then that's when ago. I was... How many? Nine years ago. Nine years ago. Wow. Wow. 
so that's when I that's when I first bu- bu- bumped into Apurva, and um, it was absolutely wonderful to see how he was running his setup. It was like so legitimately beautifully sustainable, and uh, you know uh, Apurva has uh, stayed very much in the field ever since then. Uh, no nasties has you know grown every year and done more and more fun and interesting things. Um, when the lockdown happened, all of a sudden, uh, Apurva was one of the first people who sort of noticed that things needed to be done a little differently. And uh, that's why I thought it would be perfect to have you here with us to kick off the series because you've been nine years ahead of the curve in many ways. And uh, I would like it if you could just start off by explaining what was what is No Nasties and how is it set up and you know how does every section of the chain work? Uh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, it's been like eight or nine years ago, I think, and we first met in Bombay. I remember reading your articles as well at that point. So good to have come full circle almost. So uh, quick background on No Nasties. So we've been doing this for almost 10 years. And uh, the main reason why we started this was because of the alarming rate of farmer suicides in India in cotton farming. Now, my background is actually in technology. I'm not related to fashion or sustainability. But when I heard about these numbers and realized that it's happening just like an overnight train ride away from Bombay where I grew up, it seemed quite shocking that not enough was being done about it. And slowly over the years, I came back, I was researching the space and understood what was causing it, met the farmer groups here as well. And finally, in 2011, we decided to launch a company which which would do two things, uh, three things actually. One was to create awareness for the issue around farmer prices. Second, also just offer a solution, not just talk about it, but offer a practical solution for people to get involved by just making a purchase of a t-shirt. You know, it would be our responsibility as a brand to make sure that the t-shirt is sustainably made and it's organic and it's fair trade and in a fair factory as well. And the third thing was to just really not work, it, work on the business with a profit mind, but really be purpose driven. So with that in mind, we said we want to collaborate as much as we possible and never compete. Um, big challenge when we started was where to source organic cotton t-shirts. Uh, the supply chain was so opaque. Uh, when we finally realized, uh, finally found out who we can work with, we decided to be completely transparent. And that process took a while. I remember we started meeting with uh, Chetna Organic in Hyderabad, and then we followed their cotton downstream. Um, I think Anjali from uh, Pondicherry is on the call as well. She's one of the people I met almost 10 years ago. And eventually we decided to work with a company called Raj Lakshmi Cotton Mills in Calcutta. So we've tried to keep it simple. The product is very simple. It's uh, everyday casual clothing, but it's always made with organic fair trade cotton. Um, so transparent supply chain, one, one farmer's co-op, one factory. And just try to be a business which is using its voice to really support the cause itself. So uh, that's our journey. We've been around, like I said, we've been around for about nine, 10 years and um, it's still going. So. But this year has been different compared to yeah. our entire history. So, Yeah, so tell us. Um, you know, they say life's really a roller coaster. It couldn't be more apt right now. Like we had an amazing year last year, our best year in the, like nine years. We had amazing plans for launching new collections. We're gonna do a yoga line, we're gonna do uh, much more expanded product range. We're thinking of getting into homeware as well. But suddenly March hits and then the pandemic hits and the lockdown hits as well and everything just came to a grinding. The first reaction was almost just denial. Like this cannot be happening. Okay, we'll get over in two weeks, three weeks lockdown, fine, no problem, keep going. But very quickly we realized that if we are feeling a sense of panic, there's a huge Sense, a much higher sense of panic and almost risk to their livelihoods for a lot of people in our society. So we did a quick check just to uh, see how we would be doing, how we would manage financially. Uh, in our very first few days, you know, we just looked at the numbers and said, okay, things might not be great for the next few quarters, but we're going to be okay financially. You know, things are, we put up a post on Instagram just saying things are shit, but we're okay. Um, and mostly okay, just because we know we are very privileged enough to have a house of a social and social circle, which will always make sure that we are we have food on the table and a roof over our heads. You know? 
and I don't think that's uh, that privilege extends to such a huge number of people who we kind of interact with on a daily basis. You know, all the daily wage workers, the vegetable guy, your uh, your local supply food, your chains, your maids, uh, whoever's helping you out and, and giving you that privileged life, they're all at risk of not even having uh, food on the table. Um, so we tried to see like, okay, while we are going through this process, how can we help others? And that actually, in a, in a, in a weird way, makes you feel good as well. Right? So, uh, it's kind of been our path to see how we can navigate this crisis by seeing how we can lend a hand to other people as well. Um, it took a, uh, took a blog post from a software company called Fresh Works, I think out in Canada or US, where they inspired us to do something called uh, a pre by local movement. Uh, the idea was very simple, that if you think you're okay, but there are people who need help right now, and people whose services you know you're going to use in the future for sure. So given that, what can we pay, what can we buy in advance? It could be goods, it could be services, anything where we can just pay by or just pay in advance to make sure that they have a lower risk during this transition. Um, that went up really well. We put it up on our Instagram and Facebook channels and a lot of other brands have picked that up as well. You know, we've seen uh, at least half a dozen uh, sustainable fashion brands in India pick it up. So happy to see that keep going. I'm going to catch a and, breather and I'll let you ask a question. Oh, sure. <laughs> so, um, what I was going to ask is in terms of no nasties and in terms of um, right now, your production centers are obviously shut. Um, and uh, I wanted to ask uh, now, these are based out of Bombay or they're based out of, um, tell, will you tell us a little bit about what, what, what happened to this, like what was going on in the production units and how that part got affected? Yeah, absolutely. So, we work with one factory, uh, Raj Lakshmi, which is based out of Calcutta. And mostly, with uh, mo almost all our cotton comes from one farmer group called Chetna Organic. Um, immediately with this lockdown, all their orders came to a halt as well. Uh, several big international orders were cancelled as well, which obviously puts them at a huge risk of just paying their wages as well. Um, our factory has about 1,200 employees, five, six different uh, factories around uh, the city. And it's a fair trade factory. It's very, very ethical, really takes care of its employees. And they were not ever going to wanting to lay off people as well, you know, but obviously the, their expenses were significant. Um, they're still trying to go get through those murky waters. Uh, slowly international orders are coming back in, but the initial month was just a huge crisis. You know, uh, we reached out to them as well, tried to see what support we can offer. Um, we just, we decided that we're just going to go ahead and pay in advance for all the orders that were in our pipeline as well. Still a small drop in the ocean, but we just thought we could do our part, you know, and if that inspires other brands to do that, great as well. Because we didn't want them to, I mean, at some point we're going to get back up. We want to make sure that they're okay as well. They are the lifeline for us as a brand and for the cause that we want as well. So, and obviously with the orders being uh, cancelled or postponed for the factory, it directly affects all the farmers there as well. Which should buy the cotton. I think luckily it was towards the end of the cotton harvest season, so the impact wasn't as much. It was, I think, a lot worse. It was around November, December. Um, a lot of the cotton was already purchased, but still in the supply chain, still going through the stages to be processed. So um, I know in one of our last uh, meetings, we had a uh, we had. Uh, Arun, who's the CEO of Chetna Organic, come in as well, and he was saying that it's uh, incredibly stressful time. So. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and um, have you, um, in terms of uh, the farmers, um, were you have you had some kind of an update or report from them? Um, we haven't heard much beyond what we've spoken to uh, Arun from Chetna, who said yeah. that there's definitely a uh, crisis there because their supply chain is popular, you know? even um, just the uncertainty of all of it is what is really difficult and for farmers it might it's not just the immediate cash flow but it's also the time to even if their current crop was harvested it's time to buy seeds and sow the next 
season's crops, and they don't have the funds for that as well. So I have no idea how they're going to solve that, but it's almost going to be reduced to scale. The scale is going to be reduced significantly for them as well. So it's almost right. a viral mode for them. So. Right. So um, going through going through all of this, um, what are they? Do, are there any sort of leads that you feel that are, that you know um, we can be exploring, or um, you know who needs to be activated to do what in terms of, of of the links that are missing right now? Because this is a system that has shown itself now to be extremely fragile, yeah. and you know as we move through the series of conversations about the shift, uh, one of you know what uh, what we're going to realize is that. A lot of people uh, operate under very cyclical uh, parameters, whether it's certain seasons, like, oh, it's wedding season, and that is where my boom comes from, or it's literally the season, the weather, and, you know, it is about growing cotton, and it's about some things have to happen at a certain point in time. So, um, what, is there anything for you that is really easily done that's not being done at the moment? Uh, for businesses that are cyclical and have these sort of very fragile parameters on which they operate? Uh, the traditional model for fashion brands is really difficult. You know, it is very seasonal. It's dependent on crops if you're doing only working only with cotton. Um, there's always a risk with every season. You know, your cotton uh, crop might be really good or really bad. You just don't know. A uh, few things you can do to mitigate, at least for the, uh, the cause of the farmers, um, and that's something which even, say, fair trade does is the model is to make sure there's a minimum so, uh, minimum purchase price for the cost. Uh, that gives some assurance and there's a government and uh, minimum price. The other initiative which has helped a lot is uh, uh, different international brands coming together and really uh, almost assuring that uh, all the cotton will be purchased for the season. You know, it's uh, for Chetna, for example, we have a uh, a uh, group of brands which are coming together called the Chetna Coalition and making sure that they will purchase all the cotton and they will support the farmers. So, uh, that reduces the risk a little bit, but beyond that, uh, the farmers still are, have to depend on the uh, market variations as well. Um, I know Chetna, are, the farmer group we work with, is uh, diversifying their portfolio as well, so they're getting into more food crops as well to see how they can mitigate this. Um, helps the crop, the crop rotation helps with the soil health as well. But it's also a, not a single point of dependency or single point of failure for so. But these are long term. I mean, it's difficult to be farming in India anyways, and then to start having these uh, fail safe mechanisms is I think still, still a long term. So. Just to move back a little bit, you were saying that before this unexpectedly happened, this was actually a great year for no nasties. And uh, that's amazing. So why don't we talk a little bit about, you know, how that sort of was that you were, you were, you were looking at that peak and all, a couple of different things that have happened on the journey along the way, which you learned and the things that you sort of pivoted into and from. Um, yeah, I think what we've seen since the last nine years, I just go back, when we started, there was not much awareness for sustainable fashion in India. There was definitely a few amazing companies uh, doing work with communities and there was a lot of work on the ground. But in general, organic was kind of understood, but mostly for food. Fair trade was unheard of in India as a marketing term, but it was still something which is there at the grassroots level. And what we've seen is that over the years, the sustainability drive has picked up. You know. And it's kind of almost, it was almost peaking the last year and this year. So a lot more people asking the questions of where the products are, where uh, the products are coming from, who's made their clothes, the fashion revolution movement as well. And we've seen that uptick around the world, not just in India. So what helped with uh, our business uh, was almost a surge of international brands that wanted to start offering ethical fa uh, fashion options. And known as these beyond our own brand, we also do a lot of B2B private label work where we take care of the entire production for quite a few different things. Uh, so we take care of um, design, packaging, final delivery, all of it. Um, and that was what really helped us have a good year last year. So, um, unfortunately, most of our clients are also related to the 
travel and tourism industry. So it's almost 50 to 60% of our business is at risk already for this year. So this crisis is, I think, even if I'm optimistic, has taken us two years back. So um, we'll see. Um, I'm hopeful that, uh, that India will pick up again. Uh, Goa seems to be a good destination for even domestic travel. Um, so we've, I'm staying hopeful, but who knows? Yeah, we're all staying hopeful. Yeah. Uh, we have a little question, which is, uh, tell us about your most recent Goa-based B2B t-shirt collaboration, please. Uh, awesome. Uh, we love working with the community. Uh, Alia, as you mentioned, you know, we first met when we were working with Shire and Funk to make their t-shirts with Monica Dogra. We made t-shirts, organic cotton t-shirts for at least a hundred different organizations, you know, music bands, NGOs, corporate t-shirts as well. Uh, one of our most fun ones, which happened last year with, with a local Goa-based uh, gin company called Stranger and Sons. Uh, we know them for a, known them for a few years. Uh, they use local botanicals. They committed to the cause and we continue to work with them. So we made some really fun merchandise for uh, Stranger and Sons. So uh, it's one of our favorite gins. Uh, and it's just nice to have that kind of relationship with people who are really committed to the local cause as well. You know, that's, that sense of community is fantastic for us. Sure. I mean, one would imagine that going forward, you know, um, brands would still be needing to engage and make, you know, things to promote um, products, spaces. Um, I mean, yeah. no matter what else happens, there's definitely going to be money to promote things. Um, a lot of that could potentially be di uh, diverted towards, you know, local companies now, especially with, the, you know, post-COVID, we even have a message from the central government yep. about supporting local. And um, that's another reason why uh, No Nasties is so cool, because it's so local and it's so connected with the communities that in which it works. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, it seems like if it seems like a really good opportunity for, uh, you know, people who would ordinarily be spending money to spend it in a place where it could make a bit of a difference, especially right now. So, you know, maybe, maybe that, that curve will, will still be a rising one. Let's see. Um, yeah, you know, one of the best things I've read uh, recently uh, in the last month, couple of months is that we're all going through a period of grief. You know, this, uh, and, um, I was in a talk and they said grief is a loss of a dream. And that's so true for everything that we've planned for. You know, we, our summer vacations are gone for the us. Our business plans are gone for the us. All the relationships, all the family that we are, is in another place feels so far away. You know, and we're, we're all being optimistic and dealing with it, but we have to go through the five stages of grief as well. You know, um, I mean, just reflect back on how maybe you were feeling yourself uh, and this is for everyone, not just for Alia. It's just like when we first started, you know, there was this sense of despair and optimism, but there's a lot of anger coming up. And now I feel, I find myself at least is really a lot, lot calmer and I've accepted the situation and I'm now looking towards being a more, in a more creative mode. So, you know, so it's, it's going to happen, but um, I think one of my biggest takeaways is how do we manage this ourselves? Like how do we manage the grief? How do we manage the psychology of our team? Uh, keep them motivated. Um, and for me, just recently what we've done is just gone back to our cause. You know, just said that if it was just a business, it's a profit-driven business, it would be difficult to motivate people in these times when it's uh, a very single-minded focus. But we're reconnecting to our cause and our mission, just trying to see why are we doing this. And then that can take us back to a sense of inspiration to say like, you know, there's a much bigger need in this crisis to really help out and reach out to folks. And I think if we can communicate that to our audience, uh, we're gonna have a lot more support going forward as well. So it's gonna be rough for the first few months, but I think this is the time when we're really building our, our voice and building our relationship with our uh, support teams. So. I mean, I guess, um, have you guys ever thought about, uh, you know, take some kind of, um, ever thought about maybe this is the phase for experimentation you know and you're when you need to maybe textile innovation or um i don't know if you guys have ever thought about no nasties as a concept is is it can apply to so many things um so if they have yeah. is that something that's in your back pocket that you've been waiting to sort of pull out 
I think I have at least half a dozen business ideas in my back pocket uh, related to community action or sustainability. Um, I barely managed to finish my to-do list with no nasties itself, you know, so I'm just taking a pause from that. Uh, but there's so much to do, you know, in terms of product range, just innovating in terms of how we, how we share our message, um, how we um, can take organic cotton to just, to change the perception of organic cotton, for example, you know, like how do we make it seem more, uh, that more approachable for the audience? One of the biggest questions we get is like, oh, it's sustainable organic, so it must be expensive. And that's not necessarily true. You know, there's a higher cost, but what our pricing is based on our values, you know, the value of the product itself and the brand. So how do we even get creative with those things? How do we innovate with that? Um, unfortunately for us, our supply chain is also kind of stuck. So there's not much product innovation happening. With, uh, there's no new sampling. We're not suddenly making new masks. So, but we're exploring that, you know, like how do we make a t-shirt with a mask built in or a hoodie, which can double up as a mask if, you, if that's the that would be awesome. Future. That's the future of fashion. Yeah, exactly. No, I think that's what I would wear. I don't want to wear just a mask. So, yeah. And we're seeing some of that come out of the fashion industry in India as well. You know, since uh, just today we saw some really nice local brands that are um, giving a complimentary mask of the same fabric and same pattern as the dresses. So, we're already fashion pairing our masks with our outfits. So, yeah. We're looking at all of it. Uh, which is also be just being kind to ourselves, working half time, and just seeing how can we just navigate this journey. Yeah. yeah. Well, just a quick one. Can I just step in? And this is a question to both of you, actually, because I know that Alia, you've really been working on this for the past uh, number of weeks, together with um, much of the team, and Apurva also. I think a lot of um, people are still questioning how much policymakers in India have done to help. Uh, along this rocky road during COVID-19. Do you, um, have you amongst your community, amongst your networks, um, got any sort of nuggets that could be perhaps um, a positive move from policymakers? What more could they have done? Um, how do you feel throughout the process? Was it, is it, do you have more information now um, than when COVID hit? Um, there's a lot of question marks out there and just to get data and information, I know that for fashion revolution, it's quite difficult in India compared to some of the other countries that we're working in. So I'd love to know a bit of insight or a bit of, um, learning perhaps that you could share with us if you have them. Ali, do you want to go first? Um, uh, well, I mean, I'd actually love to hear what you've heard. <laughs> um, we are still doing our research and speaking to people, so it's very yeah. fragmented for us, but to tell, to, to let me know. I think a couple of examples, you know, we spoke about uh, migrant, work, migrant workers and daily wage earners, and we spoke about farmers as, as well and the prices which they're facing. Um, I'm a little bit cynical, to be honest, but I just feel like the policy changes, the government support is just coming a little too late. Um, it's coming, but it's not maybe not at the, not well planned ahead. Uh, give you a quick example. So one thing which we did as part of our, uh, work here in the community is also, we, uh, we launched a fundraiser for migrant workers who were stuck here in the construction industry in Goa. Uh, we worked with a local NGO called Goa Outreach, which was, uh, buying food in bulk and actually delivering to migrant workers homes. Uh, one by one, you know, and they've worked with 2,000 plus workers who are here. And that work should have been done by the government. Right? That policy, sh it should have been in place right away, knowing that, okay, there are millions of workers stuck in each state. And you're seeing the crisis across the country, you know, the migration of workers, um, the fear which they have as well. Um, I just feel like, I would just wish that it was a little bit more well-planned. So. We're seeing those policy changes and the support coming with the financial stimulus as well, both for workers as well as farmers. But it's, it's two months into the crisis, you know, this is the life and death for most of these guys. So yeah. um, just wish we were a little bit more organized at a government level. So, 
yeah i mean just as a lay person it was rather sh- it was a bit shocking to see the sort of lack of uh, sort of nodal coordination i guess you could say and mm-hmm. uh, i mean my other the other work that i do is in the film business um and we have very strong unions so um it was you know in a way it was easier to uh, coordinate with people and and figure out what was happening in everybody's units um mm-hmm. but broadly speaking i didn't see, i don't see that kind of those kind of structures in fashion um at least not ones because it's a much bigger playing field um and in generally of course i mean i think that it was everybody was uh, you know there was a, there were like 100 fundraisers to you know around me uh, for people who wanted to help other people but the government was sort of absent for a long time um not not the on the ground officers but like just in terms of funding um everybody yeah. was asking us for funding and yeah. it was almost like this this yeah there's no public funds available for this this particular pressing issue of feeding and clothing and looking after people who are stranded in the middle of a lockdown so yeah i mean i would it i don't know if it was a lack of coordination or if it was just um, you know um just that we broke <laughs> so yeah yeah that was uh, so in terms of policies i mean i guess they're just announcing things so this story right i mean we're hearing a little bit which is why i said I'm, i mean we started these talks uh, now and not earlier also because we were sort of hoping to you know weave in some kind of an action point for people saying that go and ask for this scheme or like this is the policy that you if this is your business then this is what you qualify for or this is what you right. should look out for or you know look at talk to these people for help but we're still putting that together and if anybody has any leads please send them to us because we are very 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 keen on building that information network for people so yeah and it's at all levels right it's coming from the national level but even the local uh, food distribution system in goa where we are you know the first week was chaos we didn't know if we could get vegetables for a week you know we were allowed to uh step out for essentials but there was police enforcement sending us back home and that initial uh, over the top uh violent approach from the police was wasn't helpful at all you know so um yeah we heard goa was pretty rough yeah for a few days in the beginning yeah yeah yeah, yeah i mean it is a big country there's no one solution that fits everything in all the states but it just i just feel like when we're announcing a financial stimulus package 2 months into the lockdown there's definitely some someone who's dropped the ball somewhere you know so i mean going forward one could almost say that you know we should we should have these uh uh response mechanisms in place um sort of like as a protocol because it will only get worse um as we go on um not if not coronavirus then you know something else something else something else and you know like further on in the series where we we will be featuring an organization that was set up specifically after a flood had wiped out a weaver community and you know um that uh, ever since we sort of met them and spoken to them the thing that is on is clear i think to me at least is that we need to build resilient systems where if everything collapses we can look after ourselves and the ones around us immediately and whatever that entails in terms of whatever generative capacity we need to have for generating capital or you know having access to food but um it's definitely going to be a different way of operating in business and in terms of just social structures because i don't think that we can ignore the fact that things are fragile and can break very easily we've right. just seen a brilliant example we've lived through it globally but it has been happening piecemeal for many in many many communities yeah. uh, especially artisan based communities get hit the most you know so we've been hearing about this Yeah, absolutely right. Just this has been an incredible demonstration of how fragile the entire world can be. So. Yeah. So, like, maybe an action plan is what we need to be working on for <laughs> in towards towards the future. Um, some kind of we love putting together manifestos. <laughs> so, uh, for sustainable businesses, um, something along those lines. Yeah. I guess I don't know if you you may have heard about things like this in all of the years of doing your own social enterprise. 
there's so much, you know, they, uh, there's so many good intentions and so many different organizations working together for that. Um, it just takes like a lot of determination and a bit of fortune as well to keep going. So, um, there is an absolute need for, for government support from this. We feel like we've been fighting this on our own or doing, stuff, doing this work in spite of the government challenges. Um, especially the last few years, you know, when you have demonetization, you have GST uh, introduced, and it just throws everything else for a job. So, but starts with a good manifesto, starts with good intentions. So, so I'm just going to check if we have a couple of questions. Sure. I think we had one from earlier. There was a question we got earlier on uh, if units are shut, how feasible is the idea of decentralizing and getting work from home for stitching and things like that? Does that, in your future, does that play a role? Is it necessary? How, how is it? How is that thought? Can you just uh, refer? Uh, decentralizing production and working, getting people to work from home and tailoring and other, uh, yeah, basically tailoring the question. In our industry, I think it's impossible. Uh, in our supply chain specifically, it's impossible. You know, all the, we need sophisticated machines for cutting. We have uh, safety mechanisms in place. Um, it will be so challenging to switch that over. I think there are other supply chains which might be already better suited to it. You know, some uh, folks who are already working with a near distributed model um, or are working on products which don't require machinery could work. You know, but with non SDs, we do a lot of screen printing. We have, uh, and that just requires a different set of uh, systems. So if you're forced to do it, I think it'll be interesting to see where we go. Uh, almost make, uh, read, redream our supply chain and see how it, how it goes. Well, okay, that's the innovation, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> um, we, we have did. another. Yeah. Uh, so we have another question, which is uh, actually from one of our colleagues, Rini. I think Rini and you had spoken a couple of days ago. Yeah. Uh, Rini was saying, uh, uh, as the lockdown lifts, how are you planning to merge commerce with WHO safety guidelines so the customer can shop safely? I guess this is about the retail experience as in when things open out. How, how, you, how do you see that uh, playing out? Um, to be honest, the WHO guidelines seem so far away. We're going to try and work on it at a local level, see what our local guidelines are. Um, employee safety, customer safety is obviously paramount. Um, we're not anywhere close to really seeing an influx of customers at risk. You know? What we've done for at least our, our office staff is uh, we've, we've had a maximum of three people coming in at any time and working in two different shifts with all the safety precautions of uh, sanitization, and washing gloves for any uh, external interaction. Um, I'm just waiting to see how it pans out with a retail experience with customers. The few ideas that we have is limiting the number of people that come in and obviously making sure that there's uh, hand sanitization coming uh, for anyone walking to protect themselves. Um, I expect most of the commerce is going to be online and not physical stores. So. And generally speaking for you, that was the pattern till now, right? And most of, a lot of it was for your retail was being on, was online. I yeah, absolutely. Our uh, retail store is only a year and a half old. So we've been primarily an online man. I think Suki wanted to say something. Yeah, we'll just to activate there. some audience participation. We've got a question. We've got Darshana raising her hand. Um, thank you for the etiquette. Um, so, Darshan, feel free to either put your, we'll put your audio on, or if you wish to share a video, we're going to integrate some audience participation and some Q&As. Um, if you would rather not show, share on video, that's fine. But do Hello. find your question. <clears throat> yeah, Hi, I'll just put the audio on. Hello, all. So nice to see Hi. all of you all in one screen. Yeah. So Hello. quick. Hi, how are you? Very good. <laughs> okay. So just a quick one with this new guideline of, uh, you know, becoming local from the center. I was wondering if uh, no nasties would be planning 
to um, to have smaller supply chains. So like right now, I understand your factory is based in Calcutta. Maybe your cotton is coming from somewhere else. But yeah. are we looking at um, maybe no nasties and maybe other businesses of your scale as well? Do you think people would look at more? Um, you know, like sourcing within a few kilometers or sourcing from within a few hundred. Will that be the way to go, or is this something that you think people should look at? I think this prob- the answer is probably different for different industries and different brands as well. Uh, one thing, so you're almost talking about like a, a hyper local model, and I think that would work really well for the food industry, for example. You know, sourcing veggies and stuff cross border doesn't seem to be a requirement almost. Um, when it comes to our own uh, um, own supply chain, uh, we're keeping local at a, we're defining local at a national level. You know, we've, we've worked really hard to keep the supply chain and we're very committed to our farmers as well. So um, working with one farmer group, so the, most of our cotton comes from Orissa, goes to Calcutta, so it's all on the East Coast and comes across. But I can't imagine re-establishing that in a, in, within Goa itself at the scale which we need to. So I don't and think we have to there yet. I think also you, I remember like you had said in the beginning that it was about a certain level. It was almost like a QC check. Like you wanted to work with people who operated at a certain level and had a certain vibe that matched yours. So you found, you went looking for that also, right? If I remember when you were setting up. We we want to give our customers not just a sustainable product, but a really high quality product as well. You know, it needs to meet, it needs to stand on, on its own feet. So, and that comes from an industry which is a little bit uh, more mature as well. So re-establishing that would be challenging. And that's not, to be honest also, it just, we want to continue supporting the folks that we have been working with all, these, all this time. This wouldn't be the right time to switch over. Okay, we have Anjali who um, has a question. Um, thank you Anjali for joining us. I know all about you and I hope to meet you one day soon. Um, so Anjali, would you like to unmute and sh- or unvideo, reveal yourself and share your question with Apurva and Alia? Good evening, everybody. Uh, my question was, um, you know, I've been uh, in the fair trade uh, fashion for more than 17 years now. And uh, I was wondering whether, you know, the premium that we give to the farmers, will it be possible going forward uh, the premium, a part of the premium can be, you know, put aside for pandemics like this or other difficult times, which is maybe related to a drought or floods. Can there be a discussion on the premium being put for difficult times? Um, and yeah, I, I love the question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Before I answer that, I just wanted to say that Anjali has been an inspiration of ours from the start. Yeah? She's mentored us before we even started and we've had amazing conversations with her. Like she said, she's been in this industry for 17 years, run an all women's uh, production unit in Pondicherry and really committed to the cause from the start. You know, it's, uh, I think it's folks uh, like her who have enabled uh, brands like ours to step into the space. So thank you, Anjali. Um, Anjali, to your question, my immediate answer is like it's tough enough for farmers anyways uh, and they so desperately need that premium for the development which they need for their sustainability but also the growth you know the technology growth the seed seed uh, procurement for organic seeds which you know is challenging in india for uh, for the uh, farmers which are spread across the country with only few seed banks i think my view would be that keep that premium for the farmers uh, in fact if anything, we know we need more. And that support for a rainy day needs to come from almost a government level at a policy level for uh, farmer insurance uh, and national disaster programs. Um, let's not take away from what we are allocating to the farmers as a premium, which is already a little tight. So, yeah. Just, yeah. So another thing like, uh, I'm um, representing the fair trade towns uh, movement in India presently. And uh, what I have noticed is that, you know, 
it has to be a collective effort. I mean, this pandemic has taught us that it cannot be just a brand with farmers or it cannot be just the supply chain, but it has to be a collective effort from consumers, but also, you know, from schools and universities and businesses and more people joining hands. It's only then that we can really take it up to governments to bring it into making a policy decision. So if it is only very limited, so I think this, what I have learned from all the workshops, all the webinars and the conferences that I've been attending for the past one and a half months is this movement has to become a more collective movement going forward to really start making impact in the government level. What do you feel about that? I couldn't agree more. So I think the fact that there are so many of us here listening to this means that we actually do care, you know, and that collective voice needs to go through organizations like fair trade, like fashion revolution up to the government level where we need that policy change. Um, they're going to listen. The government's going to listen to the people eventually. You know, it's aligned. Their interests are aligned with ours, uh, and collectively we can do this. So. I love that thought. The government is going to listen to the people eventually. It's great. Everybody keep that thought in their head. Uh, Suki, should do you want to? Should we? There's a couple yeah. more questions. So we've got um, a hand raised for quite some time from Yuvraj. Um, yeah. so I'd ask Yuvraj to ask his question. And then next in line, we'll have Bhargavi. And then we've got a question for Tanya. So Yuvraj, over to you. Please do introduce yourself and then fire away with your question. Hi, everyone. Uh, my question is regarding uh, how about uh, technology intervention uh, uh, can help uh, sustainable fashion uh, more uh, uh, helpful towards setting up the uh, entire supply chain and uh, tell us about uh, how uh, vertically integrated setup like uh, mass manufacturing can be adopted in sustainable fashion so that uh, micro manufacturing units all over uh, like global level can set up to support like uh, say for example uh, procurement of raw material to dispatch of products so that Globally, every part of uh, uh, like the supply chain can be benefited in terms of job opportunity or in terms of uh, uh, making a sustainable fashion more uh, reach to every audience. This is what uh, my question. So, so have you got a short form version of that? I mean, did you get the question? Apurva? I think what I took away from that was that what can we do from a technology point of view to help sustainable fashion brands? Yeah. Um, you great question. I think technology would be fantastic. Um, I don't know who would invest the resources, uh, both time and money into that. You know, it, what we've seen in the industry is that there are brands that are doing it, uh, but they're only after they reach a certain scale. You know, small brands like ours, which have less than 10 people, just don't have the resources to really look into that. Uh, if there is a movement which is happening, we're happy to join and uh, work collectively. But unless it comes from a government level, policy level, or some other technology, uh, some other uh, NGO or foundation which is supporting that, it's really challenging to find that solution. So, um, so there are definitely things which are happening. Uh, there's even small things like uh, drip irrigation technology, uh, which has now become more common than before, um, I think are great. But there's so much to be done. You know, con connecting consumers to farmers, brands, uh, the whole supply chain. Yeah, I'm sure there's opportunity there. Alia, sorry, I cut you off. Yeah. No, no, I was just gonna say that um, you know, just to uh, uh, sort of explain what do you mean by the technology, because. Uh, I'm sure it can apply to a different, there, there are different levels of it, like the, your drip irrigation is in agriculture, but even in terms of maybe like inventory management or um, yeah. you know, other ways of, of sort of um, what mobile, well, how could you streamline certain, what is, the, what is the process that you wish would happen faster in, in your life right now? Or, you know, or is it, is, it just, is it just a factor of there are only so many machines available at any one point in time and I have to wait my turn for the, you know, for, the, it. for, the, for it when it's free. That. I think that's a great way of, uh, of uh, phrasing that as well. I think 
across the entire chain having some kind of traceability, maybe a mobile app which allows us traceability from uh, seed all the way to the final uh, product on the shelf would be great. You know, it could be real time inventory data coming back in. Um, Yuvraj mentioned like having a vertically integrated system and that's what would allow that. Right now with the different players in the supply chain, like uh, rural farmers then going through different um, value added services like spinning and ginning and finally to a factory. There are just too many players who would have to work collectively but there's no incentive for them to do that. You know, they're just all heads down just trying to make ends meet. So. Gee, if only there was one body that had all our data and all the power to make all this information add up <laughs> to something. Oh, I wonder what. All right, should we move on to another question? Uh, we have a question from um, Bhargavi, um, which I can read out because she's listed it here. But Bhargavi, please do um, participate if you wish to. Her question is, I wanted to ask if sustainable brands would compromise with their prices going forward and make it more accessible. Um, believe it or not, we get that question so often, but we've also, so I'll give you our point of view from non estics. Yeah, we price based on the value which we offer and where our brand stands, you know. The big uh, factor for pricing and why the perception is that organic sustainable brands are more expensive, it's to do with scale. Uh, our products cost more because we pay ex almost 30% extra for organic fair trade. Uh, we work with smaller units. But in the end, it's just, I sell only a few hundred pieces a month and I need to make a certain amount to sustain. And that's what our pricing is. Having said that, we feel our pricing is quite aggressive. Our, T-shirts for kids start at like 400 rupees or men's adults t-shirts start at 1200. Um, and I can, I know for sure that the exact same product in an international brand, international country sells for Forex. You know, we've tried to keep it mid price, uh, a midpoint in the market. Um, with uh, this crisis, what we're trying to do is... I think uh, I yeah, ahead, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, uh, I ask this because in general, the perception is not only about no nasties, but in general about all the sustainable brands that they are priced really high. Some of yeah. the brands go in for simple dresses like 16,000, 14,000 ranges and all that. So in order to make that accessible, like I, even I started my own uh, brand a few months ago and I've tried to keep uh, the prices to uh, minimum profit so that people could access the brands first and then realize what it is and then um, kind of but so what about like what do you think about the collective of the whole sustainable um, group of brands like as in would they or would they not or so my point was that the selling price of the product has very little to do with the actual cost whether it's sustainable or not sustainable you know uh, a big brand like Adidas selling a t-shirt for fourteen hundred doesn't that t-shirt doesn't cost as much as or much more than a smaller brand making it, right? It's got to do with brand positioning and brand size. Uh, we'd like to offer it as low a price as we can, uh, but you just got to make sure that it aligns with what your real costs are. So, what? Um, and also scale of production is a big factor, I would imagine. Yes. If somebody is making five things versus 50 things. So, yeah. I mean, yeah, as in, it's very interesting as a, um, because we deal with sustainable fashion across, you know, uh, so many different people who use the term sustainable brands. Um, and uh, obviously we've seen people charging five times as much, but people have always charged for certain things like hand loom, hand, you know, hand work. Um, you know, there are many things that uh, increase the price of a product. And I, I mean, I think it's not just you have to see what goes into making that sustainable, that thing sustainable, as opposed to uh, everything saying that it's sustainable and therefore it's costly. But if there are certain pieces where I remember very early on, somebody said it took three people worked on that for a month. Yes, you should be paying 50,000 rupees for it. So I was like, okay, okay, sorry. You know, but I so said everyone has their own notion of, of, of what that is. It's sustainable because it's not 
uh, you know, if they're not using uh, uh, machine production or it's sustainable because something else, it's uh, the, the fabric is hand woven. Everybody has their own definition leading to sustainable broadly within a whole bunch of other things. So the pricing, yeah. Part of me, since you said you're just starting out a brand as well, I'm assuming it's, I'm hoping it's sustainable. It, yes. The business has to be sustainable for you. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise it doesn't yeah. work. That's me. We've been very lucky to be around after nine, after nine, 10 years, but it hasn't been easy. You know, we've come close to bankruptcy. We've had to uh, wow. put our own money back in uh, with, our, with the ups and downs here. Um, and this crisis would have been one or another one of those if we hadn't had a good year last year. So um, happy to talk more about it. Pricing is complicated. Uh, if you want, you can reach out to me directly at Nonasty's uh, email address or my, my phone number. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm happy to chat about it. Thank you for your question. Um, so I'm going to move on to the, a question from Daksh, Daksh Didia. I hope I've said that right, sorry. Um, one, how will marketing, I think this is very much um, an Apurva question, how will the marketing by small brands need to change after the pandemic to bounce sales back up? And part two of that question is, how can a pure wholesale brand shift to a DTC or e-commerce model? I have noticed that in these past six weeks and a lot of brands that we've been talking to are switching to um, um, fast track their brands to be selling online more so. Um, yeah. But yeah, so two parts of that question, how will marketing by small, small brands need to change um, to bounce sales back? And then we can hit part two. Sure. Um, and there's a, one, there's a question about that from Tanya as well. Yeah? So we get that next. Um, uh, okay. So marketing for me has always been about what the customers care about, right? And the context has changed completely in this. What, what conversations we are having are different. What people care about are different. Um, I feel like going forward, it's, the world's gonna be extremely polarized. There's gonna be the whole YOLO crowd who just wants to have a good life and uh, it doesn't matter what the cost is, but there are, I feel a bigger population shift is gonna to be towards sustainability. You know? Really seeing how can we prevent something like this from happening? How do we care a lot? What we're doing as a small brand, small sustainable brand is really doubling down on the value which we add to the planet and to the people and, the, and what goes into the planet. You know, if you see our Instagram messaging, it's uh, the last few days, especially after we've been talking about local, is really saying where our product comes from, why do we work with what we uh, work with, you know, why do we use only organic cotton, what, is, what we think is sustainable versus not sustainable in this industry. So really saying, uh, really selling your USP in a very clear way, in a way which attracts the audience where they are at right now. You know? If you're in a different mind space, if everyone's in, your, in a different mind space, you've got to talk to them at that point. You know, we cannot do the pre-COVID conversations again about bargain selling, about um, just the product design. So I hope that helps. Uh, we're hoping that that's, uh, that's going to work for us. We're going to be sharing our story a lot more than selling our product. That makes sense. Uh, touch the second part. How can a pure wholesale brand shift to a DTC e-commerce model? It's tough. Uh, creating a brand is extremely tough. You know, getting consumer mindset is a long process. Um, the good news is it's easier than ever to get online to get a physical, uh, to get an online presence, get the word out on social media. But you've got to find your tribe, uh, talk to your end consumers and see how you can create a name for yourself. So, but it's not an overnight shift by any means. Um, next question from Tanya. Do you know if there is a directory to find farmers and um, craft clusters? Uh, Tanya, there are a few. Uh, if you're looking for organic cotton specifically, uh, if you go to the website for GOTS, GOTS is Global Organic Textile Standard, which is the standard for what we do. Uh, they have a listing of uh, all the supply chain members who are certified. I imagine Fairtrade can help you out as well. Devina is on call as well, and Fairtrade has uh, several, uh, several lists which they've shared with us at least, so I know they're there. So I don't know if it's public domain or not, but Devina, maybe you can. 
but yes, there are there are listings, there are directories. I think, uh, Sukhi, I think we've we come to the end of the questions. Uh, yes, we have. I think that's pretty much um, covered now in terms of questions from the audience. Um, unless there's anything any, anybody else would like to share, please do raise your hand. Um, but before you wrap up, I know you're going to sort of conclude or uh, wrap up soon. I would love for us all to take a moment and just have um, a gallery share of all our participants. And please do unveil yourselves if you're um, yes. do so. It'd be lovely to see cameras you. on. If you can, and we'll just change the view. Hi, Stefano. Nice to see you. We can do a. Thank you, everybody, for taking your time out. All definitely care about sustainable fair trade fashion and a part of the fashion revolution. And uh, any questions, anything anybody wants to say? Bavia, great to see you here. You in Jaipur? Great. Shruti, lovely to see you. Thank you all for joining. Um, Alia, you might want to take the baton oh, and continue. Uh, sure. I just wanted to uh, thank Apurva, first of all. Thank you so much. It was so lovely thank to you. hear from you. And we really look forward to you know all the ideas and everything that you're going to come up with. We will be following the story of No Nasties. Um, I would just like to let everybody know that tomorrow we have another session as well. Please come back. Uh, we will be speaking to a couple of young designers who normally would make bridal wear and uh, they're going to be telling us how, uh, you know, their lives changed and what they've done about it. Uh, you'll find the information on our Instagram handle. And we're going to continue to do these talks. We have Stefano. We'll be speaking to Ivers Asari as well later on in the week. And we'll be speaking to a couple of other people. So please just stay tuned. Uh, I don't know if he heard us. No, he's not responding, but it's okay. Uh, ciao, Stefano. Can you hear me? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> he got it. Okay. So I yes, just, so I just wanted, okay, okay, okay. So uh, yeah, yeah, so just wanted to. Yeah. Is there any? So, Anybody wants to share? Um, essentially, these dialogues are all about um, collecting information from one another, and yeah. we will be rolling out a series of these dialogues. It's really about engagement with you all. Um, we do have guest speakers, and there's a channel of discussion that we're steering down. But if anybody wants to say anything, please do. Um, this is a collective collaboration, or else Ali is going to do a nice little wrap up, I'm sure. Yeah, so we would, uh, what we're trying to do is basically like sort of unfold the story uh, one person at a time and, uh, you know, just keep adding to it and see what uh, useful inputs we can take out of it. And uh, the world is going to shift on its own. Uh, we just want to be maybe like one or two steps ahead of the shift so that, uh, you know, everybody gets to, uh, gets a little bit, let's get everything a little bit ahead of time and can be a little bit more prepared. And uh, as somebody said earlier, it's about collective knowledge, collective action. Uh, so that's the purpose of putting together these dialogues. So please come back for more. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Suki. Bye. Thank you. I guess we have to. We should. Apoi